And this is the last section, Unit 4, we look at occupational health. And a uh, little joke there, there's um, yeah, some good news and bad news. The bad news is Wally fell into the sander machine. The good news is he's nice and smooth. Okay, let's go on to the next section then. The aim of this unit is to introduce you to health hazards, hazardous substances, ergonomics and workstation design, manual handling and noise. And by the end of this unit you should be able to name four types of health hazard, identify three hazardous substance signs, define the word ergonomics, give the four areas to be considered when making a manual handling risk assessment, and define noise. Well, first one, health hazards. Let's have a look at the four different types of health hazards. And they are physical, chemical, biological, and ergonomics. Physical, a lot to do with the environmental factors such as temperature, noise, vibration, pressure, radiation, and dust. If you work with chemicals such as organic or inorganic compounds, acid, alkalis, different metals, Biological, the living entities, the parasites, bacteria, protoctis, protozoa, things like animal born, zoonoses, or human born, or vegetable born. And er ergonomics looks at job movements, friction, and pressure. The different types of illnesses and diseases. First of all, we could get back and upper limb disorders. WYULD stands for Work Related Upper Limb Disorder. That's anything from the waist up to the neck. So anything affecting your arms, anything affecting your wrists, your fingers, your shoulders, your neck, your spine, including your discs. Occupational deafness. Stress and depression. Dermatitis. Occupational asthma. Asbestosis, silicosis. The factors that affect occupational health include the environment, your workstations, that bubble, that place you inhabit when you're actually doing your job, and the working procedures that you adopt when you're undertaking your duties. Okay, Kosh by Gosh, what does that stand for? It stands for the control of substances hazardous to health control of substances hazardous to health. So what is a hazardous substance? It's any material or substance with the potential to cause illness or injury to the people who come into contact with it. Now they could come in the form of liquids or powders, fumes, solids, gases, vapors, dusts or living organisms where we'd be or where we'd call them a biohazard. Now for five bonus points, can you tell me what you think the difference is between a fume and a vapour? What is the difference between a fume and a vapour? And believe me, I've had some good answers to this over the past few years. Not all of them correct, but very good answers nonetheless. Okay, a vapour consists of liquid particles such as steam or a solvent, and a fume consists of solid particles, such as welder's fume, for example, contains particles of lead. Now, hazardous substances may be toxic, irritant, explosive, reactive, allergens, corrosive, carcinogenic, inflammable, or disease agents. And we carry out a cautious assessment of all hazardous substances. All hazardous substances must be, assess must be assessed for the prevention of exposure and for the protection of employees. Now, how do the substances get into the body? There are four routes of entry. What do you think they are? How do the substances get into the body? Well, they are ingestion through swallowing, injection, cuts or injuries, inhalation and absorption. And the most common route of entry is inhalation. And there's a cosh assessment 
Now, if you look at that, it's no different from the generic risk assessment which you've already written about, or you've already taken notes of. The only difference is, number one, identify hazardous substances, not just hazards. Number two, identify who's at risk. Evaluate the risk, high, medium or low, or give it a numerical value. Determine what control measures might be necessary. Now that could be elimination of the product, or can we substitute the product for a safer product? We need to record and review the assessments, and inform employers of all risks and provide suitable instruction, training and supervision. And these are some COSH signs. First of all, what type of sign is it? Yes, it's a warning sign, yellow triangle. So, the one up the top left hand corner, what do you think that might be? Again, as we go through the signs, if you want to pause them, have a think, write down what you think the answer is, and then restart the presentation. So, the first one is what? It's a corrosive material. What about the top right hand corner? Now, this is one which you'll see in a lot of domestic chemicals. Harmful or irritant. The left hand side middle. Quite straightforward, what do you think that is? It's an explosive material. The one on the right hand side is an oxidant material. And the straightforward one on the bottom is toxic material. Now there is one missing off there, and that is flammable substances. And they come in three degrees of flammability. Flammable, highly flammable, and extremely flammable. And extremely flammable is the sign you'll see on a lot of your domestic products, such as antiperspirants, deodorants, and hairsprays. Um, here's a question for you as well. For 10 bonus points, what do you think the difference is between flammable and inflammable? And again, over the years I've had some good answers to this. Not correct answers, but good answers. Well, the answer is... They mean exactly the same. Flammable and inflammable are in interchangeable words. Kosh, by gosh, before handling or using any chemicals, read and observe the label and the hazard data sheets provided by the manufacturer or supplier. Always use safe working practices. Never put chemicals into unmarked containers, as long as you don't know what are in the containers, Never ever put them into food containers or drinks containers because people might think that the product in the container is the product that it says on the label and there's been a lot of people poisoned and killed over the years through that particular procedure. Always handle chemicals with care. Never mix different types of chemicals. It can kill. For example, if you mix bleach or sodium hypochlorite with an acidic cleaner or even urine, it will give off chlorine gas, which can kill you in a confined space. Chlorine gas mixes with your saliva, in your trachea, and it uh, produces hydrochloric acid, which can start to burn you apart. So be careful with bleach. Bleach is banned in most commercial establishments that I know, uh, especially catering establishments. Uh, it's banned within all local councils, local governments, uh, civil service. The, the major user or consumer of bleach these days is the domestic market. But in my own personal opinion, they should ban it. It's only my opinion, but it's true. Chemical store. Always ensure chemicals are safely locked away and not in areas where they might, for example, with food, uh, contaminate food, or come into contact with customers who might uh, drink them thinking that they had drinks, for example, if they kept in drinks containers. Know the first aid treatment required if you spill chemicals on yourself or others, and report any faulty equipment, spillage or damaged containers to your supervisors. And these, this last point under the, the orange line there, please be careful where you tip your chemicals these days. 
it's not just appropriate to tip all your chemicals down the toilet or down the outside drains because a lot of chemicals will react with the flora or fauna and the environment and start to kill or have adverse effects on the environment. So just check the labels on the containers and it will tell you if they are biodegradable and you're allowed to tip them down sinks or sewers or toilets, then by all means you can, but please check the label first. Okay, ergonomics. What's ergonomics? Daddy, what's ergonomy? It's making children tall enough not to have dads bend so much. Yes, never a true word. Ergonomics actual definition is the interaction between people, the equipment they're working with, and the environment they're working under. It's all about workplace design, workstation and equipment design, work methods and procedures. If a workstation is not ergonomically designed for the person that's using it, then that can give rise to work-related upper limb disorders. That can be because of you using repetition, using force, working at an awkward posture, or having insufficient rest periods. We can prevent that by equipment and job redesign, reduce repetition, force and stress, improve posture, provide and follow training, and improve the environment.